Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to the 2017 Royal Tyrrell Museum Speaker Series. Today, the Royal Tyrrell Museum and its Cooperating Society are proud to present Mr. Derek Larson. Derek is Assistant Curator at the Philip J. Curie Dinosaur Museum in Wembley, Alberta, just northwest of Grand Prairie. Derek grew up in the prairies of southwestern Saskatchewan and spent many summers visiting the Royal Tyrrell Museum in Drumheller and later the T-Rex Discovery Center in East End, Saskatchewan. He obtained both his bachelor's degree and master's degree in the Department of Biological Sciences at the University of Alberta. For his thesis, Derek studied the vertebrate fauna of the Milk River Formation of Southern Alberta. Subsequently, he moved to Toronto in order to pursue a PhD in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at the University of Toronto. For his dissertation, Derek studied the relationship between tooth morphology and diet in theropod dinosaurs and modern monitor lizards. And just last year, Derek was hired to become the assistant curator at the Philip J. Curie Dinosaur Museum. Derek has spent a great deal of his research career studying Cretaceous teeth, but he is interested in the diversity, evolution, and ecology of different vertebrate groups in the late Cretaceous, especially the biogeographic relationship between northern and southern vertebrate faunas. Over the years, Derek has conducted fieldwork in, field in Alberta, Montana, South Dakota, and Mongolia. Today, Derek will discuss what he has learned about the changes in dinosaur and di theropod diversity in the last 18 million years of the Cretaceous based on the study of their teeth. So without further delay, I present you Mr. Derek Larson. Uh, thank you very much, Francois, for that uh, introduction. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here at the uh, Royal Tarot Museum. It's also a pleasure to see so many familiar faces in the audience, although there go the lights, and I guess I won't see you guys smiling up at me, but uh, thank you for having me. I uh, appreciate it. And uh, the talk today is uh, going to be some new research um, integrated with uh, some of my older research uh, looking at uh, theropod teeth uh, in the late Cretaceous of North America. And uh, what that can tell us about um, the, uh, the diversity, the morphology, and the, uh, the evolution of these small theropods uh, in the late Cretaceous. Uh, so uh, the uh, study uh, in, uh, in the late Cretaceous uh, that I'm most interested in really uh, are questions concerning the sort of reconstruction of uh, the uh, ecosystems uh, that were around back then and seeing in particular how those ecosystems change through time. So the things that I'm going to be talking about today just to, to highlight are going to be mainly three different um, uh, focuses um, using uh, theropod teeth. So uh, I'll be looking at diversity or species richness. Uh, th that is, how many species uh, are there and, and how can, can theropod teeth tell us about that? Uh, I, I we'll be looking at uh, disparity or morphological diversity. That is, how different uh, these uh, different uh, teeth are from each other. And then I'll be looking at the evolution and, and actually fitting some evolutionary models uh, looking at uh, uh, these, these teeth through time. So th this all relates back to um, th the discussion of uh, uh, how these ecosystems are changing through time and as well what in particular is happening in these ecosystems as you go through time leading up to the end Cretaceous extinction. And uh, this has been a question that's been discussed uh, among a number of different paleontologists and how fast is this extinction? We all know about the meteorite that, that slammed into the Earth 66 million years ago, um, but there's sort of been a bit of a debate among paleontologists of when the, that meteorite struck. Was the ecosystem at that time very diverse or what? Was there a, uh, a decline in diversity leading up to this extinction event? That is, was there sort of a, a, a pattern of, of loss of species uh, before the meteorite even struck? And depending on which uh, papers you read, you get very different results. Um, looking at just the raw diversity has, has uh, looked at or has, has found that there is a decrease between the uh, 
two last sort of time bins in the Cretaceous before the extinction, and that you have uh, much higher diversity in the Campanian than in the Maastrichtian. Those are the two last stages. Um, but then uh, using some uh, uh, corrections uh, and, and estimates, uh, some authors have found that uh, based uh, on on the sort of data that is presumed to be missing in some of these, these units, um, that diversity was not decreasing. Although, if other correction factors, in this case on the right here, um, looking at um, uh, uh, adjusting that diversity based on preservation in the rock record as sort of a, a proxy for the preservation potential of these fossils, has found that there, is, in fact, is some decreases in some of these major groups. So this is sort of the, uh, the question that I wanted to address uh, with theropod dinosaurs. And theropods um, that, for those of you who don't know, are classically the, the uh, meat-eating dinosaurs, although uh, you can talk to me at length about whether or not they were necessarily eating meat. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the theropod dinosaurs, particularly the small theropod dinosaurs, are a very interesting group. Um, and they're interesting for a number of reasons, uh, not least of which is the fact that they're the, the closest relatives of modern birds. They're also uh, one of the most poorly understood uh, groups uh, in the late Cretaceous. This is a, uh, a figure from a paper uh, by uh, uh, Caleb Brown and others. Uh, looking at the preservation of dinosaurs in uh, Dinosaur Provincial Park. And uh, <clears throat> you can see this, uh, these bars represent how, complete, um, how completely we know uh, specimens uh, of any particular species. And it's arranged by body size. So the smallest animals are on the left, the largest animals are on the right. And you can see that the most complete animals are all the large individuals. Um, all of the small individuals, and this includes all of the small theropods, um, so uh, things like uh, uh, dromaeosaurs, the raptor dinosaurs, um, as well as, as troodontids, um, which I will show you guys in a minute. But uh, these animals are not very well represented in the fossil record. And in fact, their best representation in the fossil record are isolated teeth. And um, the, uh, the, these, this group, um, is um, related, as I said, to modern birds. And some people disagree about the exact nature of uh, the extinction of, of, modern, or of uh, theropod dinosaurs and, and the diversification of modern birds and where this timing occurred. So this is the extinction event. Um, there were many groups, including toothed birds, um, living in the Cretaceous um, that all went extinct at that end Cretaceous boundary as well. So uh, looking at, whoop, and, and uh, fossil birds are, are also very, very poorly known in the fossil record. Uh, but we do have their teeth, and we have teeth in abundance. And uh, this, these are a few of the uh, animals I'll be looking at today. So these teeth are generally uh, triangular when you look at them uh, from the side. They're curved slightly. They often have denticles or serrations, uh, often on both the uh, back and the front. Uh, and they are different uh, enough from each other in terms of the size and shape of the, the denticles that you can tell these uh, apart fairly reliably in terms of what species are represented. So we have things uh, like dromaeosaurs up here, those uh, like raptor dinosaurs. Uh, we have troodontids down here, which are characterized by their very large denticles, um, which are close, they're a close relative of, of dromaeosaurs. And then we have sort of an obscure group of, of dinosaurs here, um, which is called Riscardoesthesia, which are characterized by these very small uh, serrations on the teeth. And we don't know exactly where they fall, but they're also probably a pretty, pretty close relative of, of the raptors. So I was interested in uh, knowing how many of these uh, 
species could be identified by their teeth uh, going through the, uh, the late Cretaceous. And to do that, I uh, amassed a data set of uh, over 3,000 um, uh, individual teeth, taking a number of uh, measurements, um, gross measurements, including uh, crown height, uh, crown width, four and a half basal length, so the, the length of, along the base, as well as a, the size of the both uh, front and back denticles. And uh, my initial analyses, uh, some of this research that you're going to see tonight, uh, or this morning, is, um, was done a few years ago now, and I use the, uh, the software uh, uh, Jump as well as some of the more recent research, I've been working mostly with the uh, statistical, pro statistic yeah, statistical program R, uh, which is freeware statistical software. And the data set that I'm working with primarily comes from uh, a number of sites in the western interior basin, so the sort of the western part of North America, including uh, many different uh, sites and localities in Alberta, but as well in, in Montana, um, going all the way down to Texas. So the process that I uh, went with in order to, to see whether or not these uh, different teeth were distinctive from each other or not um, in order to, to determine uh, what, uh, how many species were present uh, is uh, something that's called uh, discriminant function analysis. And for that, what I did was I took each group of teeth that had sort of been identified as its own species and restricted it by the different rock units by which they were found. And, and then I compared the different species that had been identified in different rock units and basically tried to uh, or used the, the method to get sort of the maximum separation that I could between the two different groups. And uh, so here's an example on the left. We see two groups that are basically Pointer is out of use. Anyways, um, on the left we see the um, uh, a unit or, 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 or two different groups of theropod teeth um, with sort of their maximum separation between them. And so in this particular case, what you actually have is a um, almost complete overlap in terms of the uh, the shape of these teeth based on the linear measurements. Uh, in contrast, on the right, what we have are two different groups of teeth uh, that are, are separated uh, mostly from each other. There's still some slight overlap, keeping in mind that these teeth um, are not all from the same position in, in uh, these animals. There's also uh, multiple individuals probably represented, multiple age groups. So um, the, when you're working with isolated teeth, um, you have to take a number of these things into account. But more or less, on the right-hand side, you see that there's mostly non-overlap between those two different groups. And in fact, those two on, on the right are, uh, are very similar looking dromaeosaurs based on the teeth, but one is from the Dinosaur Park Formation, um, from Dinosaur Provincial Park, and the other is uh, from the Horseshoe Canyon Formation, which, uh, whose holotype specimen was found relatively close to the museum, actually. And so um, using this method, I was able to go through all 3,000 teeth in order to determine um, which groups were um, uh, separate enough from each other that you could actually tell uh, based on their measurements. And so I got uh, as a result uh, this graph here. So this is sort of grouped into sort of the different, uh, different broad families across the uh, the top, so there's sort of uh, four different columns um, of theropod teeth that are very similar, uh, but in actuality, all of the uh, uh, pictures that you can see there with their, their time ranges uh, are actually separate from each other um, using this discriminant function analysis. So, so all of the teeth that were uh, found uh, to be separate from each other, uh, it could be argued, are, are probably unique species. And so you get a, a sense using this method um, that, uh, in contrast to what, what some authors have said in, in that, 
you know, basically all 18 million years, so you just have the same species going through time. We're really coming away from that now and realizing that there are different species um, turning over through this time. And you can look at this um, uh, abundance of species, this is just by my, my time bins there, um, and see the, the raw diversity. So this is the species richness that I'm talking about, the number of species that you see in each of these time units through time. Um, and it does decrease slightly as you get towards the, uh, the later ages, which is towards the top. Uh, now it's a question of, is that a real signal that we're getting? Because it doesn't change a lot. It's only a, a, a handful of, of species or a couple species. Um, so it's a, a question of, is, is diversity decreasing? So um, after this study, I decided to look at uh, diversity in a different way. Um, but uh, one of the, the benefits of looking at, at uh, diversity, though, before I move on, was uh, this paper, which I was happy to contribute to, uh, looking at uh, a new species of uh, raptor dinosaur that lived alongside uh, T-Rex at the end of the Cretaceous. Uh, and we uh, called this animal uh, Cararaptor uh, uh, temertiorum. Um, and so this is known from uh, as you can see in the top right corner, two jawbones, so not a lot. As I said, these, these animals are very poorly known. But it was distinct enough from all of the other known raptor dinosaurs uh, that we could um, uh, actually identify it. And luckily enough, in, in the maxilla, the upper jaw, it did have teeth. And so we could use some features of the teeth, actually, um, the size of the denticles, the shape of the denticles as well. It has these sort of... I, don't know how well you can see it on the projector, but it has characteristic ridges that sort of run along the length of the tooth as well. Uh, and we could use these characters to uh, definitively identify this, this, uh, this species. Uh, and I can use those characters um, in the isolated tooth record that, that we have uh, to identify this species as well. So that's a, a good step forward. And, and uh, so this is, this is something that, uh, of course, is, is specimen dependent. Uh, we're always looking, hopefully, for more uh, teeth in jaws. And I'm hoping to expand this data set. In fact, uh, 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 you should uh, keep your uh, ears out for new um, finds that, that I, I am working on a few different projects relating to uh, teeth and jaws, which we haven't published yet. But that will, again, help us sort out some of this taxonomic mess of, you know, what teeth are definitely from a particular species, because the isolated teeth are, are um, as I said, there's a little bit of a gray area when you have things like uh, overlap in, in the teeth in, in terms of their shape. But uh, this specimen worked very well, and this is uh, some of the, the data that I used to show, uh, in fact, that, that these isolated teeth uh, were the same as a Cararaptor. And you can see uh, on the left, this is all of the teeth that I had up until that point um, from the rock unit where it was from, the Hell Creek Formation. And you can see that all of the different colors sort of uh, are clustered together uh, in, in a way that makes sense. And, and the only two that overlap are the red and blue circles. And what that is is that's the uh, dromaeosaur teeth, the raptor teeth that I'd found isolated from the Hell Creek Formation, and the Acaraptor teeth that were actually in the jaw. So you can see actually that they fall out exactly where you would expect them to. Uh, it gets a little bit fuzzier when you look at on the right. Uh, these are all of the raptor teeth um, in the, the data set uh, from a number of different uh, time units in Alberta. Um, and uh, you can see that the blue and the red still overlap, uh, but they also overlap a little bit with uh, the uh, teeth from uh, Sornithalestes, which is a raptor from, from Dinosaur Provincial Park. But generally, things again are still approximately where, where you would expect them to be, given that these isolated teeth are probably just isolated remains of, of a Cararaptor. So that's the kind of work that you can do when you actually have teeth in jaws, which is, which is nice. But I wanted to look at this um, uh, diversity question um, in another way. And to do that, I looked at what's called disparity, or morphological diversity. And uh, that's sort of a measure of the, uh, the variance, the, uh, the variation within a group. 
um, to uh, get a, a, a capture of diversity. So you can look at these two examples on the left. We have three sort of oval shapes that are exhibiting some low disparity. They're very similar in shape um, versus something on the right that's high disparity. There's more variation in that group. And you can apply this to dinosaurs as well. So these are some, some dinosaur skulls. And you can see that the, the group that is sort of more different from each other uh, has, has higher disparity. And uh, paleontologists have used um, uh, examinations of disparity to look at this idea as well in the past of whether or not um, species um, are, are sort of in decline before their extinction. And this pattern has been shown. These are uh, some uh, uh, invertebrates um, that, that show this pattern where the, the morphological variation decreases in the group um, immediately before they go extinct. And aspects of this have been uh, shown in, in dinosaurs as well using, using a couple of different methods. And, and in fact, has, has found that uh, there is or there are decreases in disparity in many groups uh, leading up to the very last uh, uh, end of the, the Cretaceous before dinosaurs go extinct. So perhaps indicates that maybe there was some morphological change that, that sort of all of the species, however many there were, were becoming more sort of similar to each other and therefore more susceptible to some sort of extinction event at the end of the Cretaceous. So for this, I uh, used uh, my, my data set. Uh, it, it was expanded slightly. But, uh, and I mainly focused on four different groups. So there were the raptor dinosaurs, the dromaeosaurs that you saw before, uh, Ricardo Estesia, that sort of um, un, uncertain uh, small meat-eating dinosaur uh, that's related to raptors with the very small denticles. Troodontids, the uh, group with the very large denticles, as well as uh, birds, aves. Uh, which actually have no denticles on their teeth, uh, as far as we can know, but are also recovered from this, this isolated tooth record. So um, uh, we do have some representatives of, of uh, birds uh, in the fossil record as well. And all of these birds, as far as we can tell, went extinct at the end of the Cretaceous. So looking at this disparity, and I've sort of separated this by a couple of different methods. Um, and that is uh, in terms of how I sort of bin things together. We have sort of very coarse bins on the left-hand side, and then finer scale bins that are sort of rock unit specific uh, on the right. And uh, you can see that there is perhaps a slight decrease in, in disparity when you look at all of the groups all together. But if you look at the separate groups, you see what is essentially a very different picture. Uh, and you can see dromaeosaurs, for instance, seem to, I mean, it's, it's a non-significant increase, but are basically the same or, or increasing disparity uh, as you go uh, towards the end of the Cretaceous, which is on the right. Um, Ricardo Estesia essentially has no change throughout their, their history, um, no significant change. Troodontids. Again, this, it's a non-significant difference, but there uh, uh, might be a decrease in, in troodontids in terms of their disparity in the, the later Cretaceous. But again, it's, it's also not concentrated in, in the Mastricti, and it, in fact, it seems to appear in the, uh, the uh, lower uh, Horseshoe Canyon formation, which is uh, uh, latest Campanian in age. So, and, and then birds as well seem to maintain this um, uh, disparity through time um, as you um, get towards the end Cretaceous. And then at the end Cretaceous, all of the groups that I mentioned go extinct. So that suggests to us that um, while uh, there are sort of um, uh, potentially different patterns in terms of, of the, the disparity, um, for the most part, they're pretty consistently maintaining um, through 18 million years of time, um, these groups in terms of their morphological disparity and then abruptly going extinct at the end of the Cretaceous. So perhaps that signal that we were seeing from the species data um, was not necessarily giving us the, the whole picture. Uh, you can also look in terms of, um, of these species in terms of, uh, or these groups in terms of morphospace occupation. Oh, I should also mention that uh, 
there is some variation as well within different rock units. So I had sort of my two groups of bins, sort of everything all lumped together and things separated by, by formation. Some of the formations are the same age, and there are some significant differences between different, different, uh, different formations. Uh, notably here, these are all the latest Cretaceous, and there seems to be some differences between these different rock units um, for some of these groups. Um, so that's a, an interesting sort of further avenue of research that I'd like to to look at, but, but for the most part, other than these, um, the patterns that you see in all of these formations is, is consistent with the overall pattern, and, th and that is that there is no change. You can also look at the, uh, uh, where these teeth sort of fall in sort of an a, uh, imaginary space that's represented by the, uh, the shape of the teeth. So you can put these teeth on this grid, um, it's a principal component grid, and uh, this is showing you sort of where these teeth fall if you sum up all of their, their uh, measurements uh, and compare them to the others. And you can see that for the most part, all of the colored patches are essentially in the same place. The, the one exception to that is the blue patch, which does seem to jump around a little bit um, between the Edmontonian and the Lancian. And you can actually see a, sort of a shift uh, towards the center of the plot uh, as you get to that point in time. And th those are the troodontids, actually. So they, they do seem to be doing something a little bit different uh, through this interval. They're also absent in, the, in our oldest uh, units. They, they uh, uh, immigrate from, from Asia uh, just before the, the Dinosaur Park um, uh, unit. Uh, but uh, other than that, Things are remarkably stable, given the, the amount of time that's represented here. And this is, is sort of showing you the, the same thing, uh, but this is actually showing you just sort of the, the center of that point, uh, uh, that cloud of points, rather. Uh, and you can see that sort of marked dog leg in, uh, in um, troodontids in the blue. So we think that these uh, animals uh, became extinct abruptly. Um, we, and that sort of fall, made us go down a, a, another path where we were wondering, you know, where exactly, or why exactly, these animals did go extinct, uh, whereas their closest relatives, uh, the birds, actually managed to survive. And I don't expect you to see really um, the names on this, this uh, graph here, but this is uh, showing you the family relationships of all of the families of modern birds. Uh, and this is uh, time calibrated to the extinction event, which occurs sort of right in the bottom here. Uh, between the uh, Cretaceous and the Paleogene, so there's a dotted line there. And you'll notice most of the branching that occurs uh, occurs either immediately at or probably a little bit after uh, that, that end Cretaceous extinction. So there were some modern birds that existed at the end of the Cretaceous, but uh, many of them diversified afterwards. And it's thought that that's probably related to the fact that there was a massive extinction event, and then a bunch of niches opened up and, and birds were able to, to prosper. But I want you to look at the colors that are sort of represented here that cross this line. And there, we've got yellow and blue, and the yellow is actually uh, species of, uh, or families of birds that today's members uh, can subsist entirely on grains the, or seeds. Um, and they, they can, uh, uh, and in some cases, makes up a huge uh, amount of their diet. Uh, and this is a, actually a resource that uh, birds with beaks are able to access in a way that these small meat-eating dinosaurs aren't able to access. They have these pointed, serrated, sort of steak knife teeth. Uh, they're not able to have a great variety in their diet, including plant material, probably. Um, and uh, so the, uh, the evolution of the beak may have, in fact, been sort of this, this key innovation that allowed birds uh, to prosper over the extinction event. Because after the meteor struck, um, there would have been um, basically a nuclear winter. Uh, it would have been uh, uh, 
the sun blotted out, very cold, photosynthesis would have been limited, ecosystems collapsed. Um, there would have also been uh, widespread uh, wildfires as well. Um, so not generally a very good place to be, even if you survive the initial sort of radiation from, from the blast itself. Uh, and animals that would be able to sort of eke out a living in this environment were the ones that were, would have been able to survive. And uh, our hypothesis is, and, and this is sort of one way of testing it, and I'm interested to look at in the future additional ways to test this hypothesis, but uh, our, our thought is that, that the modern birds would have been able to survive because of the seeds that were sort of already in the soil. Uh, after the impact, you know, you, you would have had tons of dormant seeds sitting in the soil that would have been very much uh, accessible. You know, all they would need to do is sort of scratch dig them and, and, and get the seeds in that way. So, uh, so that's sort of our, our working hypothesis about why these small meat-eating dinosaurs might have died off, and, but their, their close relatives surviving. And uh, I'm certainly interested to see what sort of further information comes um, to light uh, looking at the extinction of this group across the, across the end Cretaceous boundary. So we get a picture that sort of looks a bit like this in, in the, the end of the Cretaceous, where we've got these small meat-eating dinosaurs. They're mainly eating other animals, uh, and they're doing quite well. Um, modern birds with beaks were there, um, but sort of hanging out in the background uh, until obviously the, the extinction of many forms occurred and then a huge amount of diversification could occur in these beaked birds. Uh, but uh, so now we've looked at, at sort of these um, diversity and uh, disparity trends across formations. I'm also interested in looking at within these rock units, within these formations, what's happening. Because uh, up until this point in, in, in the talk and in, in, in my research career, I've mainly just assumed that everything in any particular rock unit is homogenous. It's going to be the same at the bottom of the rock unit versus at the top. But we all know that, that evolution doesn't necessarily occur in these uh, nice uh, snippets in the fossil record where, where everything is one species uh, throughout an entire unit. There can be speciation that's occurring, there can be uh, evolution uh, within a lineage, uh, and I wanted to tackle that next um, to using some of these small, small theropod teeth. So this is a couple of the different sort of evolutionary models uh, that can be applied to um, uh, morphological data. Uh, and you can see uh, here a couple of things. There's uh, what's called a, um, a random walk. So it's basically a Brownian motion where things, and this is on the left here, where things just sort of move around, um, not going in any particular direction. You have things like on the right, on the, the black line there, which is a directional random walk, which is actually a, uh, a trend line in a particular direction with still some wiggle room. Uh, there's also what's called stasis, which is sort of the gray line on the right, which is things more or less stay the same, um, but there, there is, of course, some, some wiggle room as well. And uh, how you uh, determine these, these various methods is you, you fit these models to your data, and then you assess the, the akaiki weights. Uh, and the, the higher the akaiki weight, the, uh, the more likely uh, your, your model um, is for, for the data. So there's also uh, things that you can look for which are shifts, and that is basically a changing rate. So you can see here, um, uh, you've got uh, on the left here, you've got uh, stasis for a period of time, then you have a shift, and then stasis um, after that as well. And then sometimes you can have points along that shift, which is what's showing you in the middle, and then just a, a trend on the other side. So these are the types of models that I, I wanted to fit to, to uh, a, a data set of theropod teeth. Uh, but I wanted to be sure that I was looking at uh, sort of single species as much as I could. So I wanted to concentrate within a formation. And for that, uh, we chose the uh, Horseshoe Canyon formation. So uh, here are some uh, 
This is at Dry Island, I believe. And, uh, and so this is the, the rocks that we have right around here. Uh, and they're great. Uh, they're a great study system to look at um, for, for looking at this because during this one continuous rock unit, um, which uh, uh, outcrops uh, over a number of, of different areas all along basically the Red Deer River Valley, uh, you have a huge time range from 74 to 69 million years. Um, it spans a, a sort of stage boundary between the Campanian and the Maastrichtian, so the two last stages of the Cretaceous. Um, and you have a huge diversity uh, and, in fact, turnover of animals uh, that also uh, uh, and, and also environmental change that's occurring in that unit as well. So uh, here, actually, I think my next slide sort of, but uh, we've, got, we've got the uh, species that are represented uh, here sort of in right in, on the right-hand side. And these are a number of the different dinosaur groups, and some of them sort of disappear, and other ones appear during this interval. The, the small theropod teeth through this unit, as far as I've been able to determine, and as far as anyone's been able to determine, are the same species at the bottom and at the top. They, they continue through this entire unit. Uh, but like I said, there's a number of other changes that are happening here. Uh, the species that we're looking at uh, are Troodon, so with the very large denticles. Uh, a raptor dinosaur called a Trosoraptor, which is known from a very nice uh, maxilla and premaxilla, um, and uh, in, in the jaws with, with teeth, as well as many isolated teeth. And then two forms that are only known from teeth, and that is another dromaeosaur, another raptor dinosaur, uh, as well as uh, uh, some species of Ricardoesthesia with the very small denticles. And so these are what we're looking at in this unit here. So you can see there's a number of uh, different uh, um, rock units that have been identified, thanks in part to, to many of the, uh, the staff here at, at the museum, um, um, many different authors. This is particular is taken from, from Eberth et al., uh, which I think there's a number of museum staff that are on that paper. Um, and uh, they, we've got um, uh, changing um, sort of magnetic polarity that you can see there. Uh, the uh, sea level uh, rise and fall is occurring through this interval. Um, as well, you have different environmental types, these sort of climate types, sort of a, a warm and wet versus a, a cool and dry environment through, through this interval. And so the uh, data set that I'm working with is sort of concentrated a bit sort of in the center of the unit. Um, it basically ranges from sort of the, the number five coal, which is fairly low down in, in, in the Drumheller member, uh, all the way up to basically the, uh, the top of the, the Tolman member um, by uh, Dry Island. So, uh, and that's my, my sample there. It's not a um, complete sample, and there's certainly holes in there that I would like to fill at some point, but uh, the, uh, as far as I know, I've got the, the, all of the specimens that we've been, have been collected and have good stratigraphic information about where exactly they fall through this unit, because that's the important thing. We're dealing with um, intervals that are the finest scale that we've yet been able to get to in the Cretaceous in terms of, uh, of being sort of less than a million years um, for, for some of these durations and intervals. So we're uh, uh, very fine scale and, and the stratigraphic information is very important. So uh, used some similar methods with, with the, the same measurements, uh, constructed a, uh, a, a principal component analysis, which you can see in the top right-hand corner, and then use those uh, pr principal components to um, be analyzed to, to track sort of the changes through, through time and, uh, and then fit evolutionary models to them. So here's Troodon, uh, and so here's the, the information that we have. The, uh, there does seem to be a significant uh, shift here. This, the model that fits this the best is actually a, uh, a stasis followed by a, general, a generalized trend. So you can see that things are sort of similar and then dramatically go to the right 
uh, and then after that, uh, they sort of flatten out again. And so during that interval, there does seem to be uh, some uh, change in terms of the, the evolutionary rate that's happening in Troodon. Uh, a Troceraptor, which is uh, 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 represented sort of at the lower levels of the formation as well as at the top. And like I said, as far as we can tell, they're identical, um, sort of disappears through, for about a million years in the middle of the formation. Um, so that's interesting. But as far as we can tell based on these models, uh, the, the, it, it's just represented by a strict stasis. That is, that the uh, morphology doesn't change through the unit. There's a little bit of variation, a little bit of noise, but as far as we know, it stays the same. But it does, it, it is absent for a period of time. Uh, the same can be said for, for the other dromaeosaurs. They're, they're absent for about half a million years, but again, they uh, fit most closely to a, a strict stasis model. They're generally uh, consistent through the unit. And then same with, uh, with Ricardo Estesia, um, and it does not appear to be, to be absent during, during that interval. So throughout this unit so far, it seems that for the most part, uh, things are are in stasis. Things are, are being, are pretty consistent. But if we match that up with uh, some of this environmental data and it, as well as, as the, the soil information here, uh, you can see that uh, this change that we see in troodontids does correspond to the sort of onset of, of a transgressive phase. So that's a sea level rise in that particular case. Um, it might explain that particular um, uh, change in terms of the evolutionary rates. It's, it's, it is also interesting as well uh, in terms of abundance. Uh, troodontids are not the most abundant thing in the very lowest most units. Uh, but then as soon as you get this, this uh, transgressive phase, they become sort of the dominant small theropod throughout this entire unit um, and remain so uh, up until the, the end of the formation. Um, what used to be more common in the lower units is, is a troceraptor, but like I said, it disappears for a period of time, and that might also be related to the transgressive phase, but it doesn't quite line up in the, in the same way. So it might be related instead to one of these uh, climatic or soil-ish uh, changes, um, perhaps a, a cool and dry environment. And same with the dromaeosaurs, might be related to a, sort of a switch to a more well-drained soil versus a, a poorly drained soil. So there's a lot of changes that are happening, and this is still sort of ongoing research, uh, but uh, there, there does seem to be, like I said, uh, for the most part, stasis through the unit. But there are these distinct shifts and, and absences that, that are, it, it will be interesting to see if, if we can, can come up with a suitable explanation for, for why that's occurring. So uh, a bit of a conclusion. So at the broadest scales uh, that I was looking at, um, there does seem to be uh, certainly some level of, of stability. Uh, a, a, they maintain steady species diversity uh, with just slight drops, um, as well as morphological diversity, disparity, uh, until the end of the Cretaceous, where they had a, a, a sudden extinction in this group. Um, this. Uh, uh, may indicate uh, that there was something about crown group birds, the birds with beaks, that were very different from these small meat-eating dinosaurs that enabled them to survive that extinction. And we've hypothesized that that was related to seed-eating, but it would be interesting to sort of further explore that avenue of research. Um, and uh, as well, it's, it's useful to note that quantitatively, so if you look at the numbers of these, these these species and, and really measure all of these teeth, um, you get a sense that, that there are differences, consistent differences in all of these different rock units all through the western interior um, that are not readily apparent when you just sort of superficially look at the teeth. You know, the teeth all kind of look triangular, they kind of all have denticles, um, but, but when you really get into sort of the details, there, there are certainly differences. So that's useful to note on the, on the broader scale. At the finest scale, um, it does appear that there is a, a shift in the mode of evolution in Troodon within the Horseshoe Canyon formation. So that's interesting, and that seems to suggest that you can't necessarily assume that any of these 
um, species within a rock unit are going to be the same throughout that entire rock unit. They can, they can change through the unit and it'll be um, useful, I think, to incorporate sort of marrying this sort of finer scale uh, information with more uh, broader scale implications in the future. Um, and as well, two species just seem to, to disappear during that interval and, and we don't think that that's uh, a, uh, a, a preservational bias because there are certainly other small theropod teeth that are there. It does seem that they, they, these are, are genuine absences, although I'd, I'd certainly like to collect a, a larger data set in order to test that. But uh, this, uh, uh, it does seem to suggest that uh, these groups are mainly stable through this interval, but, but with, with changes that we definitely need to, to sort of take into account um, in our other analyses. So. Um, yeah, and and uh, as I uh, said at the beginning, you know, we I'm most interested in this uh, these sort of changing dynamics through time uh, in the late Cretaceous, and uh, uh, hopefully these uh, results have given you a little bit of an insight in terms of uh, how these things were changing for this I think very interesting and important group. So thank you very much for your time. And uh, in terms of uh, future directions, I'd like to note that I am working on uh, other projects relating to the diet of these animals as well, using uh, living monitor lizards as well. So uh, that's going to be sort of some, some new research for me in the future, and uh, I look forward to, to talking to you guys about this. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me, uh, the various funding sources that have allowed me to do this work um, and, and to travel here and, and to host me. So uh, thank you, and, and many, many discussions I've had with some of you in the audience. So thank you very much.